Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill Author's Preface In every chapter of this book, mention has been made of the money-making secret which has made fortunes for more than 500 exceedingly wealthy men whom I have carefully analyzed over a long period of years. The secret was brought to my attention by Andrew Carnegie more than a quarter of a century ago. The canny, lovable old Scotsman carelessly tossed it into my mind when I was but a boy. Then he sat back in his chair with a merry twinkle in his eyes and watched carefully to see if I had brains enough to understand the full significance of what he had said to me. When he saw that I had grasped the idea, he asked if I would be willing to spend twenty years or more preparing myself to take it to the world, to men and women who, without the secret, might go through life as failures. I said I would, and with Mr. Carnegie's cooperation, I've kept my promise. This book contains the secret, after having been put to the practical test by thousands of people in almost every walk of life. It was Mr. Carnegie's idea that the magic formula which gave him a stupendous fortune ought to be placed within reach of people who do not have time to investigate how men make money, and it was his hope that I might test and demonstrate the soundness of the formula through the experience of men and women in every calling. He believed the formula should be taught in all public schools and colleges, and expressed the opinion that if it were properly taught, it would so revolutionize the entire educational system that the time spent in school would be reduced to less than half. His experience with Charles M. Schwab and other young men of Mr. Schwab's type convinced Mr. Carnegie that much of which was taught in schools is of no value whatsoever in connection with the business of earning a living or accumulating riches. He had arrived at this decision because he had taken into his business one young man after another, many of them with but little schooling, and by coaching them in the use of this formula, developed in them rare leadership. Moreover, his coaching made fortunes for every one of them who followed his instructions. In the chapter on faith, you'll read the astounding story of the organization of the giant United States Steel Corporation, as it was conceived and carried out by one of the young men through whom Mr. Carnegie proved his formula will work for all who are ready for it. This single application of the secret by that young man, Charles M. Schwab, made him a huge fortune in both money and opportunity. Roughly speaking, this particular application of the formula was worth $600 million. These facts, and they are facts, well known to almost everyone who knew Mr. Carnegie, give you a fair idea of what the reading of this book may bring to you provided you know what it is that you want. Even before it had undergone 20 years of practical testing, the secret was passed on to more than 100,000 men and women who have used it for their personal benefit, as Mr. Carnegie planned that they should. Some have made fortunes with it. Others have used it successfully in creating harmony in their homes. A clergyman used it so effectively that it brought him an income of upwards of $75,000 a year. Arthur Nash, a Cincinnati tailor, used his near-bankrupt business as a guinea pig on which to test the formula. The business came to life and made a fortune for its owners, and it's still thriving, though Mr. Nash is gone. The experiment was so unique that newspapers and magazines gave it more than a million dollars worth of laudatory publicity. The secret was passed on to Stuart Austin Weir of Dallas, Texas. He was ready for it, so ready that he gave up his profession and studied law. Did he succeed? That story is told, too. I gave the secret to Jennings Randolph the day he graduated from college, and he has used it so successfully that he is now serving his third term as a member of Congress with an excellent opportunity to keep on using it until it carries him to the White House. While serving as an advertising manager of the LaSalle Extension University, when it was little more than a name, I had the privilege of seeing J.G. Chaplain, president of the university, used the formula so effectively that he has since made the LaSalle one of the great extension schools of the country. The secret to which I refer has been mentioned no fewer than a hundred times throughout this book. It has not been named directly, for it seems to work more successfully when it is merely uncovered and left in sight, where those who are ready and searching for it may pick it up. This is why Mr. Carnegie tossed it to me so quietly, without giving me its specific name. If you are ready to put it to use you will recognize this secret at least once in every chapter. I wish I might feel privileged to tell you how you will know if you are ready, but that would deprive you of much of the benefit you will receive when you make the discovery in your own way. While this book was being written, my own son, who was then finishing the last year of his college work, 
picked up the manuscript of Chapter 2, read it, and discovered the secret himself. He used the information so effectively that he went directly into a responsible position at the beginning salary greater than the average man ever earns. His story has been briefly described in Chapter 2. When you read it, perhaps you'll dismiss any feeling you may have had at the beginning of the book that it promised too much. And, too, if you have ever been discouraged, if you have had difficulties to surmount which took the very soul out of you, if you have tried and failed, if you were ever handicapped by illness or physical affliction, this story of my son's discovery and the use of the Carnegie formula may prove to be the oasis in the desert of lost hope for which you have been searching. This secret has extensively been used by President Woodrow Wilson during the World War. It is passed on to every soldier who fought in the war, carefully wrapped in the training received before going to the front. President Wilson told me it was a strong factor in raising the funds needed for the war. More than 20 years ago, Honorable Manuel L. Quazan, then Resident Commissioner of the Philippine Islands, was inspired by the secret to gain freedom for his people. He has gained freedom for the Philippines and is the first president of the free state. A peculiar thing about the secret is that those who once acquire it and use it find themselves literally swept on to success with but little effort, and they never again submit to failure. If you doubt this, study the names of those who have used it, wherever they have been mentioned. Check their records for yourself and be convinced. There is no such thing as something for nothing. The secret to which I refer can be had without a price, although the price is far less than its value. It cannot be had at any price by those who are not intentionally searching for it. It cannot be given away. It cannot be purchased for money, for the reason that it comes in two parts. One part is already in possession of those who already are ready for it. The secret serves equally well all who are ready for it. Education has nothing to do with it. Long before I was born, the secret had found its way into the possession of Thomas Edison, and he used it so intelligently that he became the world's leading inventor, although he had but three months of schooling. The secret was passed on to a business associate of Mr. Edison. He used it so effectively that, although he was then making only 12000 a year, he accumulated a great fortune and then retired from active business while still a young man. You'll find his story at the beginning of the first chapter. It should convince you that riches are not beyond your reach, that you can still be what you wish to be, that money, fame, recognition, and happiness can be had by all who are ready and determined to have these blessings. How do I know these things? You should have the answer before you finish this book. You may find it in the very first chapter or on the last page. While I was performing the 20-year task of research, which I had undertaken at Mr. Carnegie's request, I analyzed hundreds of well-known men, many of whom admitted that they have accumulated their vast fortunes through the aid of the Carnegie secret. Among these men were Henry Ford, William Wrigley Jr., John Wanamaker, James J. Hill, George S. Parker, E. M. Statler, Henry L. Doherty, Cyrus H. K. Curtis, George Eastman, Theodore Roosevelt, John W. Davis, Albert Hubbard, Wilbur Wright, William Jennings Bryan, J. Ogden Armour, Charles M. Schwab, Harris F. Williams, John D. Rockefeller, Thomas Edison, F. W. Woolworth, Woodrow Wilson, W. M. Howard Taft, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, Arthur Nash, Clarence Darrow. These names represent but a small fraction of the hundreds of well-known Americans whose achievements, financially and otherwise, prove that those who understand and apply the Carnegie secret reach high stations in life. I have never known anyone who was inspired to use the secret who did not achieve noteworthy success in his chosen calling. I have never known any person to distinguish himself or to accumulate riches of any consequence without possession of the secret. From these two facts I draw the conclusion that the secret is more important as a part of the knowledge essential for self-determination than any which one receives through what is popularly known as education. What is education anyway? This has been answered in full detail. As far as schooling is concerned, many of these men had very little. John Wanamaker once told me that with what little schooling he had, he acquired very much the same manner as a modern locomotive takes on water, by scooping it up as it runs. Henry Ford never reached high school, let alone college. I'm not attempting to minimize the value of schooling, 
but I am trying to express my earnest belief that those who master and apply the secret will reach high stations, accumulate riches, and bargain with life on their own terms, even if their schooling has been meager. Somewhere, as you read, the secret to which I refer will jump from the page and stand boldly before you, if you're ready for it. When it appears, you'll recognize it. Whether you receive the sign in the first or last chapter, stop for a moment when it presents itself and turn down a glass, for that occasion will mark the most important turning point of your life. We pass now to chapter one and to the story of my dear friend who has generously acknowledged having seen the mystic sign and whose business achievements are evidence enough that he turned down a glass. As you read his story and the others, remember that they deal with the important problems of life, such as all men experience. The problems arising from one's endeavor to earn a living, to find hope, courage, contentment, and peace of mind, to accumulate riches, and to enjoy freedom of body and spirit. Remember, too, as you go through the book, that it deals with facts and not with fiction, its purpose being to convey a great universal truth through which all who are ready may learn not only what to do, but also how to do it, and receive as well the needed stimulus to make a start. As a final word of preparation, before you begin the first chapter, may I offer one brief suggestion which may provide a clue by which the Carnegie secret may be recognized. It is this. All achievement, all earned riches, have their beginning in an idea. If you are ready for the secret, you already possess one half of it. Therefore, will readily recognize the other half the moment it reaches your mind. The Author The Author 